I hope everyone's managed to be served at least the first go around. Um, before I start with a few announcements and then introduce our speaker, uh, I would like to urge you to help feel free. I don't think our speaker or uh, certainly I won't mind if you get up and go down and get your coffee, uh, which are in the big urns down on the right. So that's available uh, for those of you who are chilled a little bit by our lovely New England summer. Um, you may want to do that. So that's available down here to, to my left. Um, in the corner of the tent. I do hope everyone is able to be dry. I'm sorry it's even wet underfoot. It was perfectly dry underfoot this morning. That's how much rain has come down in the last four or five hours. So uh, it's simply a fact that we've been living with for the last six weeks that there's a lot of raining this year uh, in Cambridge. Um, let me welcome all of you uh, in particular, of course, the alumni, but also faculty, staff, and all of the guests of any of the above. Uh, let me welcome you all uh, back to Harvard Divinity School, I think, for most of you. And it's a great pleasure to have you here today. Uh, I hope you've been able to enjoy the morning sessions. Um, and uh, we're running a little late now, but for very good reason. The last session was quite wonderful, and I hope everyone got to hear that. Um, let me uh, just recognize very briefly, I hope she's here. Is Gwendolyn Moore here? Gwen, are you in the room? Would you stand up? Gwen was recognized last night with the first Decade Award. For her tremendous work, particularly in China, with poverty and illiteracy. And uh, we just want to congratulate Gwen again and recognize her. And in absentia, we can recognize Joe Fagan, uh, uh, who uh, was last night recognized with the Rabbi Martin Katzenstein Award, another of our two, the other of our two alumni awards. And he was recognized particularly for his scholarly work on racism and sexism. And I'm very sorry that he couldn't be with us today, uh, but uh, we were very glad to be able to recognize these two outstanding uh, alumni of this school. And so... For both of them, I hope, Joan, will them, you, that you, uh, Gwen, will, uh, will accept our thanks uh, also uh, for Joe. Um, I would like to move uh, with, uh, with one more announcement very rapidly to our program, so I'll try not to hold you up. Uh, I, do, I would like to at least ask those in the 50th reunion class, of which I understand we have a few, if they might stand and receive our special applause if you're back for your 50th reunion. What do we have here? Steve, is that you? <laughs> and now for the 25th. How many are back for the 25th? Here we are. Welcome back. Over here, too, with, we have several scattered across the room. I hope you can find each other. And, of course, to everyone from all of the classes, again, welcome and thank you for coming back. Um, to conclude this uh, year of celebration here of the 50th anniversary of women, we've, of course, had our morning program, which I think was remarkable in many ways. Uh, but I think now we come to really the high point, uh, and for me in many ways the high point of the year, and that is to have invited back and have Margaret Miles, a former colleague uh, and certainly a longtime friend, our first woman tenured faculty member in this faculty, uh, to come back to deliver our keynote address this afternoon. And it's my honor to be able to, rec to introduce her. Um, she has this distinction that everyone mentions here of being the first tenured female professor at Harvard Divinity School. I also discovered when I came to the Divinity School that she was the last person to be even promoted uh, from within the school at all uh, for 20 years. Uh, and I'd like to say that I think the good news for Margaret and for many others is that we've managed to promote three people uh, in the time in the last three years. Uh, two of whom are also women. Uh, so I'd like to think that times are changing for the better. We, 
of course have about, I think it's 11 now tenured women faculty members, so, uh, or 11 fa women faculty members, tenured women faculty members. So that, I think, is a, a salutary development, uh, uh, certainly since the time when Margaret came and, and, and was path-breaking uh, in her career here. Um, she has worked throughout her career in areas oft generally known as historical theology, but also very much in theology, and particularly, I think, with respect to feminist thinking, uh, her theological thinking has been really quite important. And the fact that she comes at it out of a long and deep study of the history of Christian thought makes it, I think, all the more powerful. Uh, certainly, my first introduction to her work was with her very first book on Augustine, uh, and I think that's a, a very fine place to start uh, and a very interesting place for someone to start who's then moved forward to make such a mark in feminist uh, theology. Um, and some would say that it's maybe an unusual move, but Margaret was certainly able to, uh, to pull this off. Uh, she is, of course, has uh, focused on patristics in part of her career. She's worked on Christian asceticism. She's been interested in religion and art and the image. She's worked, on, as I said, on gender theory and feminist theory. And in more recent years, she's even turned to film criticism as well as literary criticism. Uh, so a person of many, many talents. Uh, she began her, her, uh, her academic work in California, uh, her native California, uh, at San Francisco State University, um, where she received both undergraduate and, and master's degrees, and then her PhD from the GTU uh, in Berkeley. She came then to HDS as an assistant professor of historical theology in 1978. And I remember very well when she arrived because uh, she almost immediately was of a great deal of help to us with undergraduates uh, teaching over in the yard where I was at the time. Uh, Margaret immediately became a great resource for our undergraduate program as well as for the doctoral students and master's students here. Um, and after serving here for Seven years, she was promoted to tenure uh, in 1985 and named the Bussey Professor two years later uh, and stayed here and was a, a highly valued member of this faculty uh, until she was wooed away back to California um, and, and to become uh, dean uh, at GTU. Uh, and her time there at the Graduate Theological Union as both Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs um, was one that also, I think, was very productive for her. And what I'm stunned by after four years as a dean is her ability to continue to have been academically productive in terms of the books she has managed to write and produce in that period of time. I stand in awe of that. Um, I can't begin to name all of her publications. Uh, she has 10 books of her own already out there, not, to, not even counting edited volumes with other, other colleagues. Uh, she's in the process of publishing an 11th, um, even as we speak, I think it's in press. Uh, and her work ranges in such wonderful ways that I, let me just mention three or four titles to give you some idea. I've already mentioned her first uh, book uh, on Augustine, uh, which uh, was Augustine on the Body, and this book started her on a series of projects uh, which she completed over a number of years uh, focused on the body and spirituality, I think it would be fair to say. Um, and after the work on Augustine, she then later did, of course, another book on Augustine, Desire and Delight, a new reading of Augustine's Confessions, uh, which came uh, about 15 years after the first publication, so she's kept going back to Augustine. But in between, she published quite a number of other works uh, of importance, I think particularly of image as insight, visual understanding in Western Christianity and secular culture, which is where her work in art and religion uh, came particularly to the fore. Uh, she also uh, has a very well-known book, which was uh, published both in hardback and then later uh, in paperback, and many of you probably know that, Carnal Knowing, uh, Female Nakedness and Religious Meaning in the Christian West. Um, and then the other uh, uh, book that perhaps many of you are aware of, 
uh, is The Word Made Flesh, A History of Christian Thought, uh, which is in a way the fruit of her work of many years on ranging over the history of Christian thought and Christian theology, uh, and I think is one that will probably be around for a long time uh, as an introduction uh, from a very thoughtful angle uh, to the history of Christian thought and theology. Uh, she is at present, um, uh, as I said, in the course of public, uh, publishing a new work called A Complex Delight, one that we can look forward to, The Secularization of the Breast from 1350 to 1750, which I've uh, heard her talk about and which is absolutely fascinating and involves indeed all of the various things that she's been doing up to now from religion to art to feminist thought uh, to historical analysis. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome such a distinguished scholar, uh, such a formerly a former colleague of such uh, a wonderful collegiality and a friend whom I treasure very, very much. Margaret, it's a pleasure to have you and thank you for coming back. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And I'm going to ignore the weather. I'm not going to take it personally or anything. <laughs> it's just lovely to see so many dear faces again. Um, people that I have worked with, enjoyed, thought about so much over the years. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. On the day in 1978 that I arrived at HDS to begin my position as an assistant professor, a senior colleague greeted me with the news that I, if I didn't publish, I wouldn't be here long. <coughs> I had never published a word, and I was scared, scared enough to put a great deal of time and energy into writing. And I got that energy, really, from HDS students, to whom I owe an enormous debt of gratitude. I'm sure that you taught me much more in those first years than I taught you. For example, I came to Harvard with no inkling of feminist awareness, no training in what has come to be known as gender studies. Students prompted me to learn and to keep learning. But after all, teaching is all about learning. It's just not rewarding unless one is learning. Teachers enter the profession because we have become addicted to learning. And once we finish graduate school, the way to keep learning is to teach. But then, as you may have noticed, some of us get stuck in a subfield under the impression that it is, quote, mastery that counts as learning rather than excitement and pleasure. To be sure, excitement and pleasure need to be continually informed and refined, but should never, never be eliminated. It's probably only, only honest to say that I began with fear. But it was not long before love and gratitude kicked in for the immense privilege of studying and endeavoring to communicate something about the wonderful and frustrating historical authors of the history of Christian thought. Reading old texts with eyes informed by current sensitivities, sensibilities, and scholarly methods has been my lifelong delight. On the day in 1985 in which I got the news that I had been awarded tenure, my car was towed from Francis Avenue. <laughs> that incident is a pretty accurate metaphor <laughs> for the com combination of opportunity and difficulty I experienced as the first tenured woman. 
I was, of course, overjoyed to be granted tenure, but I also felt that it wasn't so much about me and my work as about a particular historical moment in which it was finally all right to appoint a woman to a tenured position. I thought with sadness of the women slightly before me for whom that historical moment had just not been there. Colleagues' expectations were high, and so were students. If there's only one tenured woman, everyone wants that woman to be the kind of model for which they yearn. No one woman can be all things to all women and men. That's why the token strategy doesn't work. There need to be many, as indeed there are presently. Then was then, now is now. At present, I'm chair of the visiting committee that comes to HDS once a year to talk with students, faculty, and administrators and staff about current initiatives and concerns. It's an opportunity for me to keep in touch with a school about which I care deeply. And this is what I see. The present HDS is a different place than the HDS I came to in 1978. Incredibly different. I am amazed at the progress made by the present dean in a relatively short period of time. And of course, there is more to do. In Donna Haraway's apt phrase, we are responsible for what we learn how to see. Our perspectives direct what we see. To become self-critical, scholars need to be in conversation with colleagues of diverse races, sexes, ethnicities, and sexual orientations so that we can show one another what we see. Harvard Divinity School has recognized that it's not simply pleasant and invigorating for scholars to have these conversations. It is an intellectual necessity. As scholars, we are only as good as the conversations in which we participate. But on to my topic. Living lovingly, I want to claim, is the most radical thing one can do in this or any other time. We have gathered today both to celebrate HDM, HDS alumni, alumni, pioneering commitments to living lovingly and to encourage one another, to urge one another on, to live in ever more passionate, generous, and loving engagement in our needy world. Today, as the year-long celebration of 50 years of women at Harvard Divinity School comes to a close, we honor especially HDS alumni who are making a difference in American society and in the world, women who are pioneers in living lovingly. Several Western authors have suggested that human beings and human societies are actually defined by their love or their fear. This is not a new claim. The fifth century African Augustine of Hippo said, if you wish to know who a person is, ask what she loves. Centuries later, Sigmund Freud suggested that to understand a person, one must ask what that person fears. 2,000 years before Franklin D. Roosevelt asserted that fear itself should be feared for its capacity to undermine human well-being, the author of the New Testament book of 1 John described the relationship of fear and love. Perfect love, he said, casts out fear. Interpreting this text for his congregation, Augustine of Hippo said that God is love, and when we love generously, freely, and without self-interest, we are God's body in the world. But the verse also implies that if love has the power to cast out fear, fear can also disable love. 
In order to live lovingly, then, we must somehow refuse to live in fear in a culture that constantly confronts us with well-publicized fears. Of course, human beings have always had much to fear. Our vulnerable bodies are, at all times, subject to disease and accident. But humans have not always lived in societies in which fear was actively cultivated. In the last several years, American daily newspapers, newscasts, news magazines have featured many causes for fear. Isolated incidents are characterized as trends, and anecdotes are substituted for facts. And since fear factors do not capture our imaginations for long, they sort of fatigue, new reasons to fear are constantly discovered. Remember Y2K, <laughs> killer bees, razor blades in Halloween candy, killer kids, road rage, anthrax, mad cow disease, computer viruses, etc., bird flu, all of these. All of these, though, have now largely yielded front page space to terrorism. There is frequently little correlation between press attention to a danger and its statistical significance. Americans fear the wrong things. That is the point of a culture of fear. Unrealistic fears are substituted for realistic dangers so woven into the fabric of everyday life that they appear to be intractable. For example, in 2001, there were over 42,000 Americans killed in motor vehicle accidents, while 3,547 people were killed worldwide in terrorist attacks, 3,000 of them on 9-11. But traffic deaths are not news, except when celebrities are involved. And there's a range also of more subtle anxieties that we consume every day. My point is not that there is no reason to fear, but rather that the culture of fear in which we live often takes our attentions and our energies away from creatively addressing the problems of American society and the world, encouraging attitudes of helplessness, or worse, aggression. Who benefits from the production of a culture of fear? The most obvious beneficiaries are TV stations, news magazines, news programs, advocacy groups selling memberships, lawyers selling class action lawsuits, and elected officials. For example, according to political commentator Yoseba Juliaka, the tragic events of September 11, 2001, quote, transformed a president whose election had been the most questioned ever into a president with the highest popularity ever. And, as Jonathan Alter wrote in Newsweek, the subtext of President Bush's advertising campaign for the 2004 election was very clear. Quote, we should be afraid, very afraid, for our physical safety should he lose, end quote. More generally, fear prompts consumption. Michael Moore observed, keep everyone afraid and they'll consume in order to feel better temporarily. In addition, though, to asking who benefits from a culture of fear, we must also ask who suffers. And the answer is everyone, but some more than others. Fear is hard on bodies. Anxiety is the number one health problem in the country, leading to epidemic depression, alcoholism, eating disorders, prescription drug addiction, to name only a few. In a culture of contagious insecurity, psychological vulnerability makes Americans willing to live in gated communities and to lose civil liberties. 
and privacy in exchange for security measures. Moreover, American society is violent because it is fearful. Americans incarcerate at 14 times the rate of Japan, eight times the rate of France, six times the rate of Canada. It is startling that the wealthiest society in the world does not feed its needy young, care for the old and the sick, and assist the poor to earn a living wage. In fact, collective neglect of those who are vulnerable is the norm. A culture of fear can paralyze our ability to address systemically the evils of poverty, hunger, desperation, and violent aggression in our homes, on our streets, and across the globe, convincing many of us that all efforts are futile, doomed to failure. But passivity, a helpless victim mentality, and aggression resulting from fear can be challenged by a committed practice of political and social engagement. This is where HDS alumni come in. Our colleagues and friends are presently doing pioneering work in resisting the effects of a culture of fear. I can mention only a few alumni among many who are doing wonderful work, describing their activities in a few words. But throughout the activities of the day, you have been seeing the faces of Harvard Divinity School graduates, the faces of Living Lovingly, you, your friends, and your colleagues. These are the faces of love. Certainly, it is a great privilege to be a student or faculty member at Harvard Divinity School. But, as several generations of HDS students have heard me say, the appropriate response to privilege is not denial and guilt, but gratitude and responsibility. Maria Karagianis, MTS 93, has said, I often felt at Harvard intellectually very, very excited and felt fortunate that I had this opportunity and I wanted to share it. Maria is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and the executive director of Discovering Justice, an organization that has educated more than 18,000 children and adults about citizenship and the judicial system. She says that her work is a way to put her HDS experience to work in the world. Quote, this is a way to share it with people who don't have the opportunity to go to HDS and spend time and money grappling with these issues. Gratitude and responsibility, there it is. Now the thing about being a pioneer is that one doesn't think of oneself that way. Pioneer is a reviewer word. People who undertake to do something new usually just see that there's something that needs to be done and no one is doing it. Karen C., human rights activist and founder of International Bridges to Justice, writes, I realized that if no one was going to start this project, I would have to do it. It then becomes one's calling or duty, a word that has negative overtones in our hedonistic society. I find R.G. Collingwood's definition of duty very useful. He says, duty is that which I, and only I, can do in this and only this situation. Love in our media culture is a much overused and abused word. Romantic love is the subject of most of our television and movie dramas. And we employ the word for even the most trivial of our fondnesses. I love animals, an HDS colleague once said. I think they're delicious. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. 
Rather than attempting to define love, let us for the moment accept Augustine's insistence that love is not primarily a state of mind or emotions, but an activity. He said, Love has feet, love has hands, which give to the poor. Love has eyes, which give information about who is in need. Love has ears. To see love's activity is to see God. What a strong statement. To see love's activity is to see God. Love is not a state one falls into passively, as usually uh, represented in American media. It's something we as individuals and as a society can actively make. We make love. Love is not, in the words of the 20th century poet E.E. E. Cummings, words, words, as if all worlds were there. In short, love is not rhetoric, but what Pierre Bourdieu called a practice of everyday life. Mary Rudkowski, MTS 77, United Nations Representative for the Children's Fund in Niger, West Africa, manages a staff of 100 people, bringing her religious commitment and her training in theology to health care, policy making, and education in Niger. Mary says, we need to think out carefully how our policies affect people in other countries and to make sure that the policies we pay for with our taxes are helping people to live better lives. I suggest that the rhetoric of romantic love in our entertainment culture effectively functions as misdirection. Now misdirection is a magician's term referring to the dramatic gesture that attracts attention in order to prevent spectators from noticing what the magician is doing with his other hand. Our society's preoccupation with romantic love takes our attention away from noticing that loving treatment of needy human beings in the form of social services, health care, and support for education is disappearing in our society. The daily practice of love requires that we acknowledge that we live with our uncertainties rather than catering to them. As human beings with limited knowledge and perspectives, we are always uncertain, even about the most crucial matters. We do not know the generously responsible way to address particular situations. We always pursue the common good in the dark, by faith, not knowing for sure what it looks like or feels like. Sometimes we don't even recognize it when we see it. However, fear that we do not possess certain knowledge of the humanly good must not be allowed to prevent our passionate commitment to it. Our religions have not helped us at this point. The dominant religious and intellectual traditions seem to have neglected the urgencies of this world in favor of attention to another world of ideas or values. Christianity, like other world religions, has traditionally been very concerned about the dangers of attachment to power and possessions but the equal dangers of resignation, passivity, and cynicism, and indifference to the suffering and struggling of other living beings has not been articulated as frequently or as forcefully. Similarly, Christians often emphasize the power and greatness of God in ways that de-emphasize human responsibility. Theologies that focus on childlike dependence on God fail to challenge Christians to mature activity and accountability. The feminist philosopher Dorothy Dinnerstein wrote, 
We never feel as grown up as we expected to feel when we were children. And because we do not always or perhaps even often feel confident and capable, we evade responsibility. Yet, we are the grown-ups. No spirituality should help us transcend the needy world in which we live, a world that requires our attention, our love, and most of all, our work. Education can itself be a crucial form of advocacy. When education is combined with activism, change happens. HDS alumni are there. Mary Hunt, PhD 74, author, educator, activist, and co-founder of WATER, Women and Theology, Ethics, and Ritual. Jacqueline Trussell, MTS 98, founder and president of blackandchristian.com, an online ministry that endeavors to bridge the gap between the pulpit and the pew and the academy. Janet Cooper Nelson, MDiv 1980, is engaged in college ministry. She has been chaplain to Mount Holyoke and Vassar Colleges and is presently university chaplain at Brown University. Letty Mandeville Russell, professor of theology at Yale Divinity School, author and advocate for women's rights internationally. Jacqueline Collins, MDiv 2003, became an Illinois state senator in 2003. She says that the decision to run for political office was not an easy one. Quote, fear is always a component when you take a risk like that. There was no guarantee of success, so I had to overcome a fear of failure and a fear that I might not be as effective as I wanted to be. I was aware that when you step into the public spotlight, you become a target. Was I willing to take that risk to make a difference? She was. We must also resist being overwhelmed by the multiplicity of the dangers facing us. Since one individual cannot work effectively on all urgent matters, each of us must take the risk and responsibility of deciding how to focus our efforts without requiring that everyone in sight focus on the same projects. Indeed, I must be grateful that others are correcting the one-sidedness of my vision by addressing problems and dangers that my experience has not equipped me to see. Annie Bovian, MDiv 90, Executive Director of Women's Advocate Ministry, was encouraged to work among women in prison by what she has called a spirit of activism at HDS. Her mission is to provide empowerment and hope for imprisoned women who are unable to speak on their own behalf. Janelle Ruppert Rice, MDiv 2003, is the founder of the Prison Education Project of Harvard University. Anne Hunter, MDiv 86, founder and executive director of Safe Havens Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence, an organization that has trained 42 Christian, Muslim, and Jewish congregations in 22 cities and towns in domestic violence prevention and intervention. Gwen Moore, MDiv 2000, founded the Gwen Moore Children of China Fund to support literacy and self-sufficiency in China. Gloria uh, White Hammond, Liz Walker, and Melinda Weeks lead My Sister's Keeper, a grassroots faith-based program helping women and children in the Sudan. 
finally, as Augustine said, we are the times. If the times are good, no, if we are good, the times are good. We are the times. If we are good, the times are good. Or in contemporary parlance, the times are us. We can resist the rhetoric of fear that surrounds us, intentionally and actively replacing it with a practice of love. We can insist on defining ourselves not by our fears, but by our loving, active concern for the beautiful world in which we live and for the consummate, irreducible, and irreplaceable worth of living beings. The effects of fear are today more evident than ever in history. But love is a formidable force for the good. Let us resolve anew to place our attention and our energies not on the rhetoric of fear, but on the politics and practice of love. Thank you.